Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar, Traumatic Hemorrhagic Shock in the ED. Uh, I'm Sam Michoud. I'll be your host this evening. I am an emergency physician uh, here in Tallahassee, Florida, and I'll be your moderator. Uh, and now on to today's session. I'd like to introduce someone who probably needs no introduction to all of you. This is Dr. Scott Weingart. Scott is an ED intensivist from New York, and he's done multiple fellowships in trauma, surgical critical care, and ECMO. Uh, he's obviously best known for his podcast, talking to himself, as he puts it, uh, about resuscitation and critical care on MCRIT, uh, which has now been downloaded uh, 20 plus million times. And uh, tonight, Scott's going to spend about 30 minutes talking to us about traumatic hemorrhage in the ED, and then we'll have a live Q&A. And so without any further ado, take it away, Scott. Thank you so much, Sam, and EB Medicine for making this possible. So, uh, you know, when I was thinking about what topic to talk about for traumatic hemorrhage, um, the one that immediately sprung to mind, because it's so quintessentially MCRIT, is the logistics of massive transfusion. Because it's something that when you read it in a textbook chapter, what you're going to see is a, a whole bunch of theoretical things, but then anyone who's been involved in a major trauma resuscitation or an upper GI bleed realizes that the real issue you're dealing with is, it's not theory, it's how the hell do I get this done expeditiously and maintain a pace that's going to keep up with how much the patient is consanguinating in front of you. So that's the, the stuff we'll talk about today. And I hopefully you'll get some real uh, juicy tips and tricks out of it. So I could speak a little bit about it, but this is not given the imprimatur most stuff on MCRIT has, which is my hands have been in it and I've never stuck my hands in whole blood yet. So I, I think it is the wave of the future uh, in terms of the patient's benefiting from it. Uh, it's a better constituency. It matches whole blood. Even with the one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, you're not getting where you would be if you just bled that same volume of whole blood. The ratios don't match out. The whole blood does. And um, the literature has shown it probably is a better product, but it's much harder to keep. It's much harder to preserve. It's much harder to keep available. And so that's going to be the restraint that keeps most places from going to it at this stage. And I'm not sure yet it would really require a more literature to bear out whether it's really worth it if there is a uh, real difficulty in making it happen. All right. So then on the far opposite side of the spectrum, you're at a shop with no blood products. So several people have asked now what what am I reaching for if I have nothing? Now, Sam, uh, do they, kind of do they really scenario. have nothing? I've never met even a critical access hospital that doesn't have a couple of units of red cells. Good. All right. Now, but I mean, if they really have nothing, they have nothing. But most places have a little. And what they mean by nothing is not much. Um, it, use what you have. But the, the key to answer this question is uh, case centra. And if any emergency department does not have case centra, then that's unacceptable. Because the worst thing is to put in a unit of FFP, have it bled out, and you've done nothing for the actual factor levels in the uh, plasma that will make a clot. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you can't keep up, uh, then all of the products you stuck in just flow back out. What you're trying to get to is the patient who's both their um, plasma milieu in terms of their shock state, their temperature, their acidosis, and their calcium level. Calcium actually has effects on clotting, uh, is right. And you have enough platelets, fibrinogen, and uh, clotting factors in so that you get that clot over the hole. And until that happens, everything you put in is just going to spread out. All right, let's shift gears and talk about intubation. So lots of questions about, you know, what RSI products you're going to use. Do you use RSI, a hypotensive exsanguinating patient? So start where you want and we'll, cool. we'll take it from there. Okay. So um, broad picture, is you need to go lower on your sedative doses and higher on your paralytic doses. And we'll talk about why that is for each one. So on the sedative doses, um, every sedative, even the allegedly hemodynamically stable ones, uh, will drop blood pressure. And this has been proven in the literature. Tominate drops blood pressure. Ketamine drops blood pressure. No matter what you use, you got to go lower than you're used to. And uh, because the sedatives will drop the blood pressure. And they do it in a number of ways. Like RSI itself is going to drop the blood pressure. You take a patient from negative pressure ventilation, where you're putting a ton of blood back to your heart to positive pressure, where you actually keep blood from going back to your heart. And that, so that's a, a death knell sometimes. It's just 
going from negative to positive. But then the sedative itself tells a brain that is slamming catecholamines, you know, sending the signals to put catecholamines out that everything's cool. That's what sedatives do, right? That's their purpose is to sedate. And that a loss of endogenous catecholtone could also cause the patient to plummet. So you lower your sedative dose. Um, the reason you raise your paralytic dose is because the cardiac output generally is pretty low on these patients. So the circulatory time takes a lot longer and you'll give your standard intubating doses and then it'll be at the two minute mark and the patient will still be moving around. You'd be like, oh my God, the IV is not working. Or did you give me the right med? And no, that's not the problem. The problem is it takes a lot longer to work. And so uh, we will give two milligrams per kilogram of sucks or rock. And that just makes it easy. Um, two milligrams per kilogram in an exsanguinating patient. Um, on the other hand, if I have to intubate a patient whose blood pressure is 50 over 30 in the midst of massive transfusion and someone's at the level one giving them product as quickly as they could put them in, you can't RSI that patient. They're going to die if you RSI them. So you have two choices. You can either wait them out to get stability. And that's an option if they're maintaining their airway and their mental status is okay. If yeah. they're starting to fade, you got to get them intubated. So you could now do a hemodynamically neutral intubation. We can intubate a patient awake with no change in their vital signs without having to do the full period of topicalization just by using ketamine. And then the key is the reason you use ketamine is to keep them breathing. So don't screw it up by then putting them on massive amounts of positive pressure ventilation once you have the tube in. Mm -hmm. So you want to just put them in, in on the ventilator in CPAP and pressure support mode. Every ventilator has it. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So first, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us about the topic. And thanks, everyone, for joining us and asking the questions. Uh, this really is, is a fantastic presentation. Uh, and, I, and I really appreciate you teaching us something. 